Welcome to Simply Walk the Talk. Our bodies and minds adapt to what we do most of the time. If you want to change your body and mind, you must change what it is you do most of the time. This podcast explores all things health, wellness, fitness, lifestyle, and biohacking. Stay tuned as we explore various thoughts, methods, and experiences from a multitude of conversations between our interesting guests and experts through many fields of work. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Simply walk the Simply walk the What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Simply Walk the Talk. Obviously, I'm your host, Joshua J. Holland. And today, da, 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 we have a very fun, fun interview with uh, my, I can say my homeboy, right? Yeah. This is my homeboy, yeah. Ian right Mitchell. Road, man. Yeah, yeah. And um, Ian has been doing a lot of really cool things. If you haven't heard his name uh, by now, then you certainly will be hearing it in the future because he's doing a lot of really cool things. Um, and so um, basically over the past decade, Ian has developed a series of novel therapeutics using lipofullogenic full, <laughs> conju, conjugates. My God, I should have read this before you sent it to me. <laughs> yeah, man, that's, uh, that was yeah. lipofullerenic conjugates. Yeah, so it's like, a, it's a little mm-hmm. bit of a tongue twister. Basically, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the bio is probably one of those crazy things because really all it means is I'm, I'm a hyper tinkerer and I play with a lot of biochemistry. <laughs> that's, that's that's it. Yeah. It. <laughs> that that saves me from having to try to pronounce all the things. And 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 in fact, you have such an extensive resume that like we could probably spend an entire podcast talking about your background. Um so yeah, that's probably let's, true. <laughs> let's 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 skip all of that. Um Agreed. a couple of things I think we can just start in with the reason why we're even talking today. I um I, I've listened to a lot of your talks on various other podcasts, and I've, I've, I've looked at a lot of your research. I'm, I spend a lot of time on your website uh, or one of the websites you have. And, um, and then when I, I kind of heard some discussion about Neural RX and Olympic RX, mm-hmm. and I believe it was on the podcast with Dave Asprey. I'm, I'm quite yeah. sure it was with Dave. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I was kind of like, all right, let me, let me check this stuff out because, you know, you had some really – like big claims on there and i'm like okay let me let me try this out i I will admit i was a little skeptical but i am no longer a skeptic in this department okay um so so we're obviously we're going to talk about that but another thing we should touch on which i thought was one of those i got chills moments is when i found out you live in tulsa oklahoma right now and i'm from oklahoma so yeah, I was like, oh man, we got to meet in person. So one of these days yeah. I'll be there where you are. <laughs> Anytime, man, you can come. The The, the lab here is, uh, it's kind of like a biohacker's playground. So yeah, feel feel free to come out. I showed you, you know, the, the red light. We've got a huge bank of red lights for red light therapy, cold plunge. Uh, we're building a, a very large scale hyperbaric high pressure chamber, you know, like the hard shell so that, yeah eight feet in diameter. <laughs> so, oh, so you can goodness. actually walk in and do your thing and hang out in the uh, hyperbaric chamber while you're working. And yeah, so it's a, wow. uh, it's a very different space. I've got my, you know, big peptide synthesis rig behind me and, you know, <laughs> this, this is part of my clean room. So we've got vent hoods in the other room. We have, you know, cell cultures and fancy microscopes and chromatographs and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Basically I've got, you know, pretty much everything that you need to try and crack lots of weirdo puzzles. So it's, uh, I, I love it. I, I am, I would be like a kid in the candy store. It, uh, it's awesome, man. I literally sure. like every day I'm jazzed to come here. <laughs> like, right. Like, so I, then, I, am, I really am. What, what would you like? What's the elevator pitch for what you do? Because I, I mean, clearly you do so much and I hate being, um, I shouldn't use the word hate, but I, I strongly dislike trying to put a person into a box. But for the sake of this show and for the sake of the people listening so that they, they can talk to 
their other friends and share information about the show, what would be like a very concise way of describing who you are and what you do? Uh, what I always say, it's kind of, it's kind of like a joke, but it really is true is I solve puzzles. And, you know, so sometimes the puzzles are for corporations. Sometimes it's for, you know, academic people. Sometimes it's for NASA, you know, I mean, it really, it genuinely, it's whatever needs to be solved. I'm kind of one of those guys that's sort of like the, uh, the last resort for a problem to get solved. You know, if you, if you've got some sort of intractable weird thing, you know, there are a couple of guys like me that, you know, just, we really like puzzles and we like figuring things out. So if you've got something that needs to be solved, people call me. And so I've got a couple of companies that I've developed around things that I think are really novel where like they're big solutions to big problems. And, and so I'll, I'll put a lot of my focus on that. And then I've got other things where, you know, I, I do consulting projects and I'm kind of lucky in that I've done pretty well. So I've got a, I, I have the liberty to be able to choose the kind of projects I work on. So I only work on things that are kind of in line with, what it is kind of the whole ethos of what I'm trying to do. And basically when I, when I opened my lab, I wrote six things on the board that I wanted to solve before I died. And then, and basically that's kind of my criteria is does this fall into the category of the things that I'm trying to execute on? Can I move the needle for humanity? And if I can, then I do it. And if I can't, then I, then I walk away, you know? And so that, that's it that's in a nutshell. That, that is beautiful, man. And uh, wow. Like, like this is the kind of stuff that you can't. Well, now you can say it to anyone you want, but it's hard to say it to the to people who who don't who don't get it, right? So it's one of those like kind of if you know you know, and I mean of course you have enough examples to kind of show people like oh well this is I've created this I've created that and I can do this I can do that, but there's gonna always be skeptics and um yeah, and I just say are. like <laughs> yeah I mean you know I I think. Maybe to a certain degree, we should be skeptical, but also... I, I actually think everybody should have healthy skepticism. Yeah. It's good. Right. right? Because yeah. questioning questioning is a good thing. Blind faith is just that. It's blind. You know, I mean, science to me, one of the things I really dig about it and what I always told my students is science is a point on a line, right? Stuff that's really cutting edge now, a thousand years from now, assuming that humanity makes it, will seem really <laughs> like ridiculously simple minded. You know, I mean... Yeah. The prevailing yeah. wisdom 600 years ago would have been the world is flat. You know, that's just the way it is, right? But that was right. the best thought at the time. And then as tech got better and, you know, Galileo Galilei and those guys kind of did their thing and said, no, actually, we're here and this is shaped like this. And, you know, I mean, you've got, you got all those, the people that are trying to push, the, push it forward and move the needle. But really, healthy skepticism is good because the things that I know to be true, a lot of them, it's... Um, it's mistaken, right? It's, it's doing the best with what we have at the moment. Like I lecture about quantum biology a lot. And last year I did a, uh, a demonstration at the, the biohacking Congress, the eighth an or seventh annual biohacking conference, I guess, Dave Asprey's thing in Florida. And I've worked with Dave a bunch over the years. And, and I was there with a company called Leela quantum. And I do, I'm the scientific advisor for Leela Q. And so uh, Philip, the fellow who started the company, asked me if I could do a demonstration in real time to show kind of the effects of quantum behavior in a physiological sense. Because, so, because a lot of people, when you say quantum, they're like, yeah, whatever. It's, you know, it's a marketing buzzword. And it is, right? Because you can buy a quantum pillowcase or you know, like something that's right, 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 absolute right. bullshit that really means nothing. But then there, there is, you know, quantum biology is actually a very emergent field. You know, there's one of the books that I had as required reading for my class when I taught at the university was uh, Life on the Edge by Jim Al Khalil and um, John Joe McFadden. And it's, it's a real book and it's all, you know, it's all, it's really good, all about quantum biology. And, and it gives examples of ways that things that we aren't quite capable of perceiving yet are cascading up and becoming biological effects. So at the conference last year, I took a fella, um, Todd Shipman, who's a good friend of mine and biohacker Todd, and he's a, you know, endurance runner, ultra marathoner, but he has a horrible shellfish allergy. Like we'll land him in the hospital kind of shellfish allergy. And so I brought him on stage and I had a can of crab meat and I opened up the crab meat and I derma rolled his forearm and put the crab meat in it. And, you know, instant histamine reaction, dig welts on the arm, puffed up, it's all red. And you, you can find this on YouTube. And then I put it, I put the crab meat in a thing called the quantum block. And which modulates things at a level that's kind of two layers below subatomic. So it's modulating things at sort of a waveform level. And I lectured about waves, you know, and I said, you know, everybody picture a wave. And I gave the audience a second. And I said, you know, most of you are picturing something like this. 
because that's what we're taught, but that's not even remotely how it works, right? It's spheres and they're moving and undulating and they have chirality. So there's a spin to them and they have a pressure and a color. And, you know, there's probably like 17, 18 different dimensions that I can, you know, say like, this is an actual tangible aspect of this thing to describe it. And when you start to look at that, you can get effects that are different. So then I took the can of crab meat out and I derma rolled his other arm and put it on and there was no reaction. And it, it seemed almost like a magic trick, right? Because, you know, you obviously don't lose a histamine reaction in three minutes. But right. what's really going on is you're not actually having the physical expression of a histamine reaction isn't because of histamines. It's because you're having a destructive interference pattern happen at a waveform level with your physiology, right? Because if you, you know, from quantum physics, if you break things down below subatomics, at its essence, what you have is all these vibrating patterns that form an integrity that coalesces to form molecules that then form, you know, your biological components. So if you affect it at the very forefront of when it's starting to become manifest in reality, then you can modulate that and get a shift. And so that's pretty much what I did is I just modulated that. So instead of having a destructive interference pattern, Todd had a constructive interference pattern. So he didn't have a reaction. It just suddenly it was modulated. So that thing worked with his biology. It's kind of like smoothing out the edges of the molecules because it's not as it's not as detrimental when it impacts your physiology right it, it goes through and instead of scraping you it's smooth and that's all it really is so you know things like that it's hard to assess but that's where we are in science right now is like we're at the level when i run a spectral analysis on those compounds there is no change if i run you know gas chromatograph or high pressure liquid chroma chromatography right so like I run something through that and it says it is a this thing. And that's as far as we get usually, right? Science basically is we're stopping at this is a box and the box is this. Yeah. We haven't really started to look at what's inside the box, right? That's like the quantum part where we start to take into account how are the electrons spinning? What's their orbital pattern? W what happens when we get those things coherent? Is there a difference if they're in phase and in coherence? And, and there, as it turns out, there are, you know, there, there are big differences, right? Like. I'll run an analysis on something in the lab that says it's the exact same compound, no different from the same source. I'll quantumly modify one and then run it through reduction oxidation potentials and get numbers that are entirely different. It still reads mm. out as the same compound, but the way it interacts with reality, totally different. You know, and, and that's kind of, that's where we are, you know, right at the edge. Boom. Boom. Yeah. That's, um, it's really interesting. One, because um, I, I did have Philip on the show with Leela Quantum yeah. Tech. Um, and so we got a chance to talk about it. And, you know, it's like, I wish he was able to explain some of these things as well as you did, because there's always going to be people who are like, ah, this is BS. But I'm like, when you just explain it the way you explained it, it's, it's, it's no longer magic. You know, it's science. No, it, it, that's the thing is I'm, that's what I love about science is I do want people to be skeptical. I do want people to ask questions because if you ask the right question, eventually you'll get the right answer. And, and if we didn't have people questioning how things worked, we'd still be back in the stone ages, right? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's requisite for us to move as a species. We've got to push the bounds. And Philip is great at articulating a lot of the, the spiritual component of things. And that too, you know, I mean, I, I don't try and actually break things. Unlike most scientists, I don't, I don't try and break things down to a point where like everything is science. I actually think it's kind of like art or like love or things like that. Mm. You can break it down and you can find out, yeah, there's a biochemical component. You know, I've released oxytocin. But do I really think in the last analysis that that's the precursor? No, I actually think that consciousness is the central component and manifest reality is the, the epiphenomenon of consciousness. It's the thing that expands from that, not the other way around. You know, and, and it's like... If you try and if you try and answer the puzzle the wrong direction, you're hosed. You're never going to get the right answers. If you if you start from it's vibratory, it's related to consciousness. It's an expression of that. It's been my personal experience that a lot of the puzzles that seem intractable for a lot of people really aren't that hard when you approach it the right way. You know, you can't climb Mount Everest from zero to twenty seven thousand feet. But if you start and you go in the right direction, it's just one little step at a time. Well said beautiful so let's 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 get into it man like i mean as if we already have it but um behind me here on my case by the lights which 
<laughs> luckily, luckily, it's protected with the mirror on glass or at least the some kind of colored glass. Um, we have we move have, to the light. I've got two of your products here in my hands, and this is I think the third bottle each of of both of these that I've that I've used. Right on. And um, so, if you're watching, you see I'm holding up two bottles. One says uh olympic rx which is the kind of green and silver one olympic rx and then the other one is neural rx and it's got a lot of cool imagery and and branding really good job with the branding but more importantly this is an amazing <laughs> um, like amazing couple of uh substances you have here so let's 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 talk about it because yeah this is honestly the reason why i was like i need to talk with this guy and then i found out that we have some of the same uh, people that we work with and we're yeah. close with, and I had no idea you were involved with Leela. And anyway, yeah, let's talk about well, it. and yeah, and the, the guys at transcriptions, and you know, yeah, we've yeah. got a lot, we got a lot of overlap actually. So yeah. the, those two things they were made for different purposes, right? So initially, the Olympic RX, I'll start there. Olympic RX, way back in the day, about a decade ago, that was kind of an outcropping of me working on longevity research, right? So. Uh, what I was doing is I was trying to figure out how to extend human lifespans. And so I started working with this compound called carbon 60, which is basically 60 carbon atoms put together in a truncated icosahedron, AKA soccer ball. So you've got this little nanoscopic soccer ball made out of carbon. And it was, it was discovered in, in 1985 and the guys got the Nobel prize in 1996, I think. And, and they're, they're all, there's only one of the three guys alive now. He's this really sweet old scientist that lives outside of Houston. Um, and he's very sharp and his chemist go, the guy's real razor, razor sharp, crackerjack ace chemist. He's, he's awesome to talk to. Um, but I started working with that compound and everybody had thought that it was going to be like some inorganic thing that's used in the industry because it's like little nano balls, right? So it's lubriscus. It's, it knocks out friction and it's really easy. It's like dropping nanoscopic ball bearings everywhere. Um, but mm. if you bind it to lipids, you can actually get it to go into the body. And so like most compounds, when people do research on it, they do a thing called an LD50, which is a lethal dosing study. And what you do is you administer the compound to lab rats and you see how much it takes to kill 50% of the population. Well, when, when the guys were doing the LD50 with the C60 bound to lipids, uh, and they used olive oil in the first round, what they found was that. Uh, they live 90, 90% longer. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, like, damn it. <laughs> yeah, right. So not only did they outlive every rat in the control group, but they outlived the, one of the other experimental groups. And then uh, on average, they live like 90% longer, which is like crazy anomalous. And so I read that research back in like 2012 when it first came out and thought, what? That seems like utter bullshit. Like that's, that's too much. Like, I, I mean, 5% jump, 10% jump, sure. Okay, that's legit. But saying that something's going to boost you 90%, I was like, yeah, I don't buy it. But, you know, I, I too, I was skeptical, but I was like, you know what? I'll try it. So I started playing around with it and I got a cohort of P53 knockout rats or knockout mice, actually. So the P53 gene is your tumor suppressor gene. So I got these rats or mice rather uh, with, the, with the tumor suppressor gene extracted, which basically means that they'll die really quickly of spontaneous tumor production. And so they, mm. they, they, they're, the, they're the mice that you always see that have the little bulbous tumors that pop out idiopathically. They just present randomly. And so, but because they're the mice that you use when you're studying oncology, there've been hundreds of thousands of them used. So they have these crazily accurate defined mortality curves. So you know, within just a couple of weeks, like the mice are gonna die at this point. And so I figured, okay, well, I can do this experiment and then I can see you know, how accurately this is going to keel over when they're supposed to. Well, the first thing I noticed was the first rat died and I dissected it and did a necropsy to see what had happened. And it didn't die of tumors. It had died of a femoral hemorrhage. And I was like, well, that's weird, but I don't, I don't do, you know, rodent necropsies every day. So I'll send it off to a vet pathologist. So the next time one died, I sent it to a vet pathologist to do a histologic workup. And they gave me all the blood work and looked at everything and no tumors. And I thought, Okay, that's really anomalous and that kept happening so there there wasn't presentation of tumors and when they were dying they were dying of organ failure and all the the symptoms of old age but on average when i was done with the entire cohort it was a 93 percent extension on average and i thought holy shit, that's like what but 
three percent statistical variance compared to the other research from France. I mean, that's that's obviously that's too tight a margin to be just chance, right? So they got a ninety percent, I got a ninety three percent. That's pretty damn tight. And so I thought, okay, I got to figure this out. So I spent the next couple of years working on it. And then I figured out a lot of ways to modulate biology and what was actually going on. And what's really happening there is you're buffering oxidative stress at the mitochondrial membrane. So those little nanospheres attached to the lipid, you ingest them, it separates off from the lipid at your cell membrane, and the nanospheres go down and they, they localize around the mitochondria. And the mitochondria, because they're where the power gets produced in your cells, well, suddenly you've like put up shield around them so that oxidative stress isn't ripping off electrons and slowing down their production of energy. So you start outputting like 18 to 58.3% more energy at the mitochondria. And so it's huge. Like that's a, mm. you know, people don't really play with ATP much, but trust me, that, that's like a giant output shift. And so that's before I did anything else. So like the Olympic serum, that's that buffering effect. But then I added in uh, NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, PQQ, pyroloquinoline quinone, uh, resveratrol, CoQ10, and the, the beta alanine, all the things there that your body needs to upregulate the different components in the electron transport chain so that not only do you block the system loss, but you boost the heck out of everything else. So the ATP output goes through the roof and your cells are more robust, the membranes are more pliable, and everything just functions better. And the, the other kicker is that the C60, because it's a dose dependent function, when you take a bunch of it, it, it basically dopes the dopes the electrical carrying capacity because it, it in and of itself is conductive. So instead of having to transmit a signal, you know, like the old way where your body kind of pushes it through, they just fly through. So the trick is you actually have to be careful when you take it because yes. instead of your brain normally allowing your body to downregulate to 25 to 30 percent of your muscle firing capacity, it goes full on skeletal recruitment. And when you say fire, it fires. And the problem there is you actually have to be, yeah. I mean, I can tell you've, you've had the experience. Um, well, 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 one of the, sorry to interrupt, but like uh, one of the things that you and I had talked about is, is, you know, working together potentially on the EMS bodysuit that yeah. I have. And, and so obviously when I get something that is called Olympic RX and it's supposed to, you know, take the ATP out of, you know, to, to astronomical levels and all these things, I'm like, uh, okay, EMS. Olympic RX, uh, big mistake, <laughs> big mistake. I mean, you know, it's like, let's just put it this way. That was the point in which I very quickly remembered you saying you got to be careful because I, you know, I got a little ahead of myself and, you know, I, I may have even, you know, created a hernia from it, which we'll talk about later. Um, but it's okay because it's like, I knew what I was getting myself into and I knew that there was the potential for that to happen because you, you explained that you're explaining it again now. And so if you are someone that's like me that did not listen, please listen. This is how powerful this stuff is. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's funny. Like I, I was talking to um, uh, my friend Ben Greenfield and, and he was like, it, it sounds like BS when you say like, be careful. It works so intensely that you can hurt yourself. But the reason I know that is because I pulled my hamstring twice and tore the muscles in my lower back before I figured out what was going down. And, and it's because I was doing sprints, right? And I went out and, and man, off the line, I like took off and just whack, you know, just sheared part of my hamstring. And I was like, oh, oh, oh not good. And, and it's because when you give the signal to fire, normally you, your body down regulates it. But the, you know, that kind of uh, the governor theory of your, of your musculature doesn't apply right so the signal and there's a really good study on it called super precipitation of skeletal muscle actomyosin right and it's a dose dependent function you get the you get a lot of that compound in and it'll just fire the entire muscle right so you get full sarcomeric recruitment and when that happens it's the, the effective equivalent of being like in a fight or flight thing you know we're like oh i've got to lift a car off my baby ah! you know yeah, yeah. And, and like so your body just full-on fires but your tendons and your ligaments don't operate as well as your muscles in terms of the, the blood flow and the capacity to heal and the, and the time to cycle. So you can put too much stress on those. And, and that's what I did. That's what you did. I mean, it happens. But if you don't do that, and you actually meter it out and you get kind of you kind of get a feel for like, OK, I could double my press, but instead I'm just going to go up by 20 percent. 
right? Yes. You do that, you ratchet it up 20% and then your healing time, like the recovery time is crazy fast because compared to what you could be doing, it's nothing. The other, the other plus is like people say, well, if I want to get really big, like bodybuilding or something, does it work? And I go, no, it doesn't. Right. Like it will make you stronger, lots stronger, right. but it's right. not going to make you bigger because you don't actually have to be bigger. You just have better muscle. Well improvement. said, well said, of course. I mean, you, you explain things in a way that may lose some people. Uh, I, I'm certainly following you. So thank you for that. But I, I think that is a very important thing to maybe even reiterate because um, there is a big difference between, you know, getting swole and size versus the recruitment and the, the ability of the actual muscle themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody's seen somebody who's freakishly strong for their size, right? What that really means is they have a different ratio for skeletal muscle recruitment, right? So even, you know, like I'm a big guy, but I'm only using, you know, like normally 25 to 30% of my capacity. If I dope myself up by doing high concentrations of C60, well, then I can use 50, 60, 70%. So I have the appearance of being freakishly strong. But at this point, I, I know that's that's not the way to roll. So, right, so right, I right. just, I, I take it kind of easy because I've, I've damaged myself before doing that. But again, like I said, if you don't do it that way and you use it as a tool to push yourself to do a little bit more and give yourself heightened capacity all the time, I mean, it's like super sauce. I, you know, it's uh, the guys that the reason it's called Olympic is that the, I was working with guys who were going out for the Olympics for pole vaulting. And, uh, you know, I called it reverse limbo when I was working with them. But, <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> the, the reverse do. limbo team. Um, so you know, they were looking for like one to 2% gains because guys going out for the Olympics, they're like in the very top percentile. But instead of that, we were getting like 13 to 17% gains. And they were, they were blown away. I mean, because normally, I mean, Olympic athletes, you don't get that kind of performance, but these guys were going huge boosts. You know, their grip strength went from like 160 pounds to over 200 pounds all the time, which wow. is crazy intense um but that's that's what they needed for that sport and it was just it's cellular biology applied in a different way right so i'm trying to modulate things from the core level and then watch the cascade up it's that that uh henry david thoreau thing of you know for every thousand hacking at the branches of evil there's one hacking at the root i'm mm. really diligently trying to be the guy that's addressing the root causation and do it yeah amazing um Thank, thank you for, for that. I think it's very, very beautiful the way you explain it. Um, before we carry on to either, you know, more about Olympic or before we carry on to Neural RX, uh, this is like the perfect timing for a Pomodoro break. So uh, mm -hmm. most people know that this is kind of a new element I've added into the show because I think it's fun. And, uh, you know, let's see what uh, Mr. Ian, Ian Mitchell has for us today. With the okay. Pomodoro break. Uh, okay, so for a Pomodoro break, one of the, the biggie things for me um, is changing your focus mentally, right? Trying to garner a little bit more of the resources that everybody has, but typically don't use. So for me, I've, you know, done diehard meditation for like 30 years. So I'll, I'll stop in the middle and take a break. And I try and kind of center myself and get my energy focused and flowing. And then I'll breathe deeply and just, I'd recommend, you know, everybody wants to do a box breath for about a minute, just cycle in on a box breath. Or if you're, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> one of those advanced yogi guys, then, you know, do some rapid breathing like that, some uh, pranayama, uh, whatever your, your breathing method is, I do that for about a minute. And then uh, the other thing that I always do is if anybody's got a notebook, my lab notebook, um, <clears throat> grab a lab notebook or a notebook and a pencil and a piece of paper and just do a mind map. And the reason I do that is because a lot of what I do is trying to solve puzzles. And a lot of the answers are already out there, but they're in different spots and they're pocketed and you may or may not make the connection initially. So I try and kind of branch out and just imagine things. And then I'll go back after the fact and go through and look and see what I wrote down, just kind of stream of consciousness, things cropping off. And a lot of times your subconscious will actually have the answers, but consciously you're not processing through it. It's kind of like sleeping on a question and you wake up and you're like, ah, oh, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, you know? yeah. So yeah. this is like, that's sort of my during the day version of how to do that is just kind of breathe, focus, meditate a little bit, and then hit it with the mind map. 
and see if you can't fan your synapses out a little bit and stumble upon the things that are actually right in front of you. That's great. Yeah, I was I was visualizing some of that and also breathing while you were talking. And I, it's like, you know, this is why I love talking with people like yourself is because I think up to this point, we've done now maybe six different episodes in which we do the Pomodoro break. And you're the first to not incorporate like some kind of physical movement, which is interesting because a, a Pomodoro break doesn't necessarily have to be about physicality. It can be about shifting your, you know, moving your mind or moving your awareness, shifting your awareness, which, you know, I have a book called the awareness shift. So that would, that obviously makes sense, right. To, to, to talk about shifting the awareness and have that be sufficient for Pomodoro break. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm letting the galaxy do the heavy lifting. I mean, we're on a planet rotating at 13,000 miles an hour in a galaxy that's spinning at millions of miles an hour, you know, so <laughs> we're still moving. It's all good. <laughs> well said, well said. Okay. So, um, for those of you that, you know, just really are interested in interested in the Olympic RX, I would 100% say try it out. And, you know, after having a, my third bottle almost be empty, um, you know, it's, it, it obviously, I like it. And, and I will admit, everyone, um, the stuff is not cheap, but it's not cheap. That's, that's why. <laughs> you, yeah, know actually, you know, that's one of the things I'm working on is the, the reason it's not cheap is because the cost of the components are stupidly high, in my opinion, kind of obnoxiously. So, and actually they've come down that that bottle would have been like hundreds of dollars a decade ago when I started working on it, but the price of carbon 60 has come down and I'm actually currently working on a new production method. So if I can get it from, you know, mm. a, a ridiculously like it, Per gram, that stuff is so stupidly expensive. <laughs> it, just, it just cracks me up. It's like gold per gram. So uh, yeah. if I can crack the code on the, the new production method, then I'll be able to radically alter that. Because my, my thing is it's so beneficial for people. I want to get it out there and make it ubiquitous. And at you know, 144 bucks a bottle, even with a discount, it's, you know, it's still not going to be something that everybody gets access to. But once I crack the code on that, you know, um, the oils are pretty much commodities and a lot of the other components aren't that expensive. Probably the second most expensive thing is PQQ than NMN. And those are, those are reasonably priced. Um, so if I can crack the code on that, then I'll be able to just get it out to everybody, which would be nice. It'd be nice if everybody could go to Walmart and be like, Oh, huh. right. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I, bro, I, you know, support you in any of that. And if there's anything I can do to help okay. in that, you know, definitely, uh, I'm here for it. And, uh, I'm quite certain that we will probably come out with some good information because I love, you know, I'm the, I'm the sort of creative artsy guy who kind of like Philip, right. Can, can talk about, you know, a certain level of, of the products that I use and especially the EMS suit, but, I just imagine the amount of knowledge I will gain by working with you on something like that. Um, so w whenever we talked about getting you that, like I, I it's still on my mind trust me. You yeah. Know? I, you know, <laughs> you were telling me what you were doing and explaining it, which yes, you, you actually, you're really full on with your explanations about the suit. Like it, it goes deep and yeah. it, I was excited. I got off the phone when I made it to the lab because I was driving in the day we were talking when I made it to the lab, I started blathering on and on about it because I was like, Oh my God. You know, there's, there's so many things that I think like there's actually, I just developed a, a new, a new material called a graphitic nanofiber aerogel, which is lighter than air and stronger than steel. So that's kind of a nifty. It's, it's <laughs> that's really, amazing. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of a cool thing, right? It's flexible and it's, it's kind of, if you think about it, it's more like flexible carbon fiber, um, but it's an aerogel and aerogels have all these kind of really interesting properties. Um, but I want to use it for vests for people like ballistic vests because if you combine that with polyethylene glycol and nanobit silica as an intermediate layer you can do all kinds of really cool stuff for people who are in war zones right that's if you ever, i don't know if you've ever seen a thing called an ooblect uh it's a non-newtonian fluid it's basically like <laughs> you take cornstarch and you mix it with water you can wow. push your finger through it but if you hit it it's solid right so it's non-newtonian in the sense that it pushes right back at you and as you put energy which normally would allow you to move through it it resists if you go slowly you can move through it right so you've probably seen videos wow. like people walking on what looks like a liquid if they stop they sink but as long as they're walking the kinetic impact 
keeps it solidified. Well, you can do the same thing with polyethylene glycol and nanobit silica so that because of the long molecular chain length of polyethylene glycol, when something impacts it, it distributes the mass, the blunt mass load over a larger area. So I figure I'm kind of pocketing those two things together to do that. And it, yeah, so some of it, like for your suit, if you have a material that you can actually make that's lighter than air, literally lighter than air, but stronger than steel or carbon fiber or anything like that, you know, it's, uh, yeah, oh it's, man, it's kind of a good thing, right? Because there's, there's definitively, anytime you're trying to help people train, there's a weight load component, right? Because you got all the yeah. electronics you have to put in it and anything else, if you want to mi modify it with red light or anything like that, haptics, photonics, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff you can do, but <clears throat> the weight is a big component. So when I got back to the lab that day after we were talking, I was all, mm. Ooh, Jazz Dude, about we're, the different we're, we're, we'll be talking for sure even yeah. even more now i mean because it's like again i i love how your mind works or at least how i see how your mind works which is you you are a very curious person and i thought i was that one of the most true. curious people i know uh but you like do laps around me so i am know, really overly is... curious man i'm a squirrel Squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your, your memory recall is great, which is probably because you're doing stuff like this. Every day. Is, yeah. This is the Neural RX, everyone. And um, so let's talk about Neural RX. And then I'm going to take some of this and I'll show you how I take it. And you can tell me if I'm doing it wrong. Um, but that'll be another component. So let's talk about Neural RX and then we'll talk about best practices in taking it and XYZ. Yeah, so Neural RX, so the, the first one, the Olympic, it's in a long chain fatty acid, right? So it's C60 bound to extra virgin olive oil, so long chain. That one that you just took, that's C60 bound to caprylic acid, which is a medium chain triglyceride. Oh yeah, that's good, let it mix. Uh, so when it's bound to a medium chain, what happens is it goes into your liver, fractionates in your liver, and it fractionates into, uh, ketones, right? So ketone bodies, so it forms beta hydroxybutyrate, which then locates up towards your brain. And so the idea is to take the neural component and get it past the blood brain barrier. So your, your body moves the ketone bodies up. So you get beta hydroxybutyrate with an inductive nanosphere moving up. And then it's also got proteolytic enzymes that are small enough to pass the blood brain barrier. And the reason for that is that was actually neural RX was designed to knock out cognitive deficits for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And when I, when I looked at it, I, I specifically looked at Alzheimer's and I, I couldn't, I couldn't crack the egg looking at it as a disease. Right. So when I, when I first came up with like my, my own theory of pathogenesis, like how does this, how does this exist? Is it a problem? What is it? Right. So I, at the end of the day, what I came up with is it's not a disease. It's actually a protective mechanism that's gone too long and unchecked. It has the auspices of a disease and we, we perceive it and we're like, oh, you know, they've lost cognitive function. Yeah, but that actually, as it turns out, seemingly has taken decades to happen, right? So you build up all these protective mechanisms. You know, you know when people uh, have visceral adipose tissue, right? It's that lacy band around their midsection, the omentum, right? O-E-M-E-N-T-U-M, right? So the omentum, if your body's pH is going to get out, right, your blood pH is going to shift, that's super detrimental and it'll kill you in a heartbeat. So what does your body do? It sequesters okay. acidity in the fat around your midsection. It packs it around the organs and that's a protective mechanism. Well, your brain has a similar protective mechanism. If you get some sort of biological insult, you know, like a, let's say P. gingivalis, or you get an environmental insult like glyphosate or heavy metals, your brain wraps those things in tau proteins and beta amyloid plaques and packs them away, right? And then it relies on the glymphatic system, which is kind of a subset of your lymphatic system that's actually located in the brain to purge at night. And so when I looked at it, what I reasoned out was that over time, you get all these aggregates in your brain and it's kind of like boulders that have built up over decades. And then your, your glymphatic system is kind of like a fire hose. Well, the fire hose can't move the boulders. So what do you do? You break down the components into smaller pieces. So that's why the proteolytic enzymes come in. Those perfuse past the blood brain barrier. And there's some really good research out of Japan that I had looked at before I did that when I started cobbling all this together and goes in and it breaks it down into small components. Well, then at night, the energetics neurally are upregulated. So your glymphatic system is more stimulated. 
So your body produces interstitial fluid pressure and, and cerebrospinal fluid pressure, and it goes in and it washes it. Well, the big boulders won't move, but if they're broken down into little pebbles, that CSF and ISF can actually push it out. So then you purge and that moves out into your lymph system. So every day when you do that, you're reducing the actual amount of physical media that's impacting your neurons detrimentally. So day after day after day, you get less and less and less of a blockage. And the correlate is you get sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper. And eventually when that stuff goes away, cognitive function returns and then you're able to function. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is the neurons that get produced are morphologically different. So just meaning the shape of the, of the new neurons is different. They actually have a longer axonal span, like two to three X, um, which is really great if you're trying to get information from point A to point B and you've got an area of occlusion, you can literally bypass it, right? Because you have enough mm. axonal span that you can move around it. And so that's, that's one component. And then just the upregulation of the energy and the firing potential if you if you've ever played with any electronics right <clears throat> if you have the gapping wrong on something you can't get it's called a spark gap literally because mm -hmm. it's a gap you're trying to get something to potentiate from one side to another which is exactly how your neurons work the way to overcome that right is to either change the proximity and get it smaller or to up the ampacity right so like you have more juice going through right so bigger bigger higher voltage or higher amperage really is more like it jumping across that gap and so that's effectively what this does is it boosts the neuronal potentiation. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. ever seen a TDCS unit, one of the transcranial direct current stimulators mm -hmm. that's effectively doing the same thing, but exogenously, you put these, you know, plates on your head and you actually hyper potentiate the neuronal flow across the hemispheres of your brain. And so this is the same thing, except it's doing it in line. And so you're basically mm -hmm. you're doping all of the neurons with the capacity to do that, to get better neuronal flow with a higher energy output. And so cognitively, as that process goes on and on, you get more clear, you have less impediments and you're able to produce more energy. So everything starts to work again. And I've seen it repeatedly over and over with people with cognitive deficits. But if you don't have what is culturally recognized as a big cognitive deficit, it is the most kick-ass nootropic <laughs> that you can possibly right. imagine. Like if right. you stack it with personally, if I want to just blow the socks off of something and it like, woo, uh, I'll stack it with phenyl paracetam and it's unstoppable. Like you can just do really mentally miraculous tasks. Yeah. Because it, the phenyl paracetam, the, the phenyl group, normal racetams have been around since the sixties, like aniracetam, coloracetam, pramiracetam, paracetam. But if you stack a phenyl group on, it upregulates at like 50, 60 X, right? So you get a huge boost. Now it's such a big shift that your body actually notices it. And if you do it for more than say a week and a half or two weeks, your body kind of nixes it. You, you don't get the effect anymore. So I only use it sporadically, but if I 100% have to be super on point and the sharpest cat in the room, then I will, you know, dose myself up with neural and take some phenyl paracetam. And then the other thing is Siltep, um, just to handle wow. IO. Yeah. So the combination of those things, you're a mental rock star. Yeah. And it, it's, it's profound. Damn. Yeah. Well, like well speaking of. Anybody try that stack. It's absolutely amazing. I think I'm going to, well, obviously I'm going to try it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for it. something else I got to try to, uh, get on this tour. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you mentioned dosing. And that's the thing I want to get into next because, um, you know, let's say someone has already just decided like, okay, this guy is brilliant. Uh, I want what he's, what he's drinking and taking and smoking. So um, I'm going to go ahead and buy these things. What do you do with it? How do you so, take it? Okay. So they're going to, they're going to affect different, different things. Actually, <clears throat> depending on the state that you're in physically, right? Like if you're in good shape, you don't have a lot of inflammation. I'd start with those two. If you have a lot of neural information or inflammation and brain fog, I'd start with the C8, which is, it doesn't have any of the added bells and whistles that the neural RX has, but it's in the same base. The reason for that is it pretty much wipes out neural inflammation. So you want to kind of get up there and take out the inflammatory response before you get up there and start adding a ton of energy into the system. So well said. If yeah, if they're inflamed, start with the and it's it's a lot less expensive because it doesn't have a lot of the components. So 
start with the C8. The same thing actually applies to the Olympic. Like if you're in great shape and you're already kind of at the top of your game, start with the Olympic, you, you'll you feel it instantly. Like a lot of the guys in the CrossFit games right now, they're doing, you know, the uh, the Olympic RX and it just crushes it, right? They, uh, I think I can think of at least three of the, you know, like world ranked competitors that are doing it um, who swear by it because it makes such a shift. But again, those are like peak performance athletes. If you're not in that state, then I'd start with the Evolve, which is just the base. So it's the extra virgin olive oil that's coupled with the C60. And I would start with that. So yeah, C60 over there, the Evolve, that's for the body. Um, now, if you are on the, the capacity where you're really kind of crushing it heavily on all fronts, then start with the Olympic and start with just two teaspoons. Um, it, it will knock your socks off. And then, you know, if you've got a really super demanding day, then ratchet it up to a tablespoon. And that's probably all you'll ever need to do. And the, and the exact same thing applies with the neural. Um, well, I, I know actually one of the guys who's kind of leading in the CrossFit games called me after his first dose and said, dude, is, is this stuff legal? I said, yeah, it's legal. <laughs> he yeah. said, I ran faster than I've ever run. And I did lifts that I haven't been able to do for seven years. Like he was putting up numbers that he, he hasn't hit for seven years. Um, wow. and that's, and, know, yeah. and that's and with it, the it, Olympic. Uh, yeah, that was with the Olympic. And so, yeah, there, there are a lot of guys and there's some, you know, quarterbacks and baseball players and, you know, like uh, one NFL quarterback that I can think of that, you know, there's a lot of cats that are on it because they're operating at the edge of what is possible physically. Right. And they're and they're still trying to push it. They, that's just how they're wired. They want to perform and exceed, you know, past anything they've done before. I think a lot of times, like for me, too, this is, uh, you know, I'm not really trying to compete with other people, but I'm trying to push myself past what I've done. And I, you know, mentally, I want to know, if, can I do it, right? Like, can I keep going? Can I keep my energy output level at the top edge of the spectrum and just keep kicking ass all the time? And right. luckily, you know, the stuff, the stuff actually works and I have access to it. So, you know, hence I keep churning along day after day after day. But, you know, it's, it's what drives you, right? So that's on the dosing front, two teaspoons a day. You know, if you're, say, 175 pounds or more, and really, if you're less than that, if, you know, just one teaspoon a day, that's going to keep you just hammering. And that's on either of those, right? Yeah, that's on both. Yeah. And then because um, one of the things that I when, when you and I first kind of connected, we had a short conversation and I had a few questions for you. So maybe we can bring that up here. Um, but like, um, should you hold it under your tongue to let it absorb one versus the other or both? Um, is there, should you do it on an empty stomach? Can you eat it with food? You know, can you go into kind of some of that? Yeah, sure. So, okay. Um, yeah, if you hold it under your tongue uh, and let it mix kind of the, the salivary blending there actually is really good, right? That, that'll increase the absorption. So yeah, um, a lot of people won't do that. Uh, it's much easier with the neural to do that just because of the taste, uh, because it's actually not too bad. And I've, you know, done the base of the Olympic for you know, going on 12 years now. And uh, once the first data was in, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to start doing this. And, I, and I've been doing it since, but uh, I still don't like the way it tastes. It's too peppery and too oily, but the results are the results, right? So I, I still right. suck it down. But the way, the way I've come to do it is I do both of them on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. And what I'll typically do is just because of my size, I'll do uh, like, I actually do probably a little bit more than anybody else, but I'll do two tablespoons of the Olympic and then one tablespoon of the neural, um, which is way more than most people need to do. Um, so like, and th that's usually because I'm kind of trying to mentally tax myself at kind of a crazy rate. Um, but normally speaking, if you hold it under your tongue and then you down the stuff, you're going to get better absorption. I would recommend on an empty stomach for the biggest pop, you can do it with food, but you just don't get as much of a boost. Um, and if you want to, like with the Olympic, what I actually always do is I'll take like a, a tea, usually like celestial seasonings, red zinger, or orange zinger. I think zinger is their, their code word for hibiscus. So mm. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, I'll just take some sort of like citrusy something. And then I put a little bit of it in my mouth and then I down a little bit of the serum and then I swish it around, down it and chase it. And that knocks out the flavor. So if you do it with like a citrus tea, 
you don't taste anything. So I just do a hot citrus tea because the, the heat also helps kind of solubilize it and get it to go down um, more rapidly. Yeah, I you know, thanks for sharing that tip. I, I will say that I have zero problems with the taste. Um, I mean, a lot I, of people I don't. I'm just kind yeah. of worse on that front because I'm like, yeah. Ugh. No. Well, I mean, you know, like I will admit it, it's not something I would like just openly ask for if I didn't know what the, if, if I wasn't getting the benefits of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I understand it. It's kind of like beer, you know, like there are some, you know, a few, a small percentage of people that actually like the taste of beer, but I always question, would you like that taste if you didn't get that effect? And <laughs> I, I would, I would imagine the answer I is no. Say no. I think right, you're right. Right. <laughs> right. Mm. So. Um, grape juice. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like wine, right? Like grape juice. We're wired for it. Ooh, sweet. Yummy. You know, yeah. fermented like, ugh, you know, right. So right. Exactly. Didn't mentally alter. Yeah. You're probably right, man. You probably, probably. Would. <laughs> so then, um, a, a couple other questions and then I, I swear we'll move on from this, but I, I am so psyched about it because I mean, yeah, like I, I want to make sure I'm doing it right. But then also I'm hoping to address some of the questions that people might have um, that watch or listen to this episode. Sure. Um, so would you, do you advise people to take this every day, even if they're not strength training or not, you, you know, co having co certain cognitive tasks? No, no, I, I actually, this is one of those things. Like I take it most days, but I, I purposely pause. And I think everybody should do this with every supplement, right? It's not going to negatively really impact you, but your body is this brilliant like mechanism that if anybody who works on physiology and isn't constantly in awe of the human body, I just think isn't paying attention because like every time I really drill down on something, I'm always like, Oh my God, wow. You know? And so it's this brilliant system where it always tries to optimize the homeostatic balance. And so if you take something in the case of this, that has a really potent antioxidant component, then over time, if you didn't give it a pause at all, it'll start to downregulate your own endogenous antioxidant production. So superoxide dismutase, glutathione. If your body doesn't have to waste energy doing something, it won't, right? So it prioritizes survival and efficiency. And if it can take that energy and put it somewhere else and it doesn't have to make those compounds, then it simply won't do it. So mm -hmm. I always tell people like with any vitamin too, just chill out, take a couple days off, cycle it. And the more random you're cycling, the better, right? I, I, I think <laughs> forgetfulness is a great tool because I just, yeah. you know, I like, oh, you know what? I forgot to take it yesterday. Sweet. And which is a good thing because it is, it's like an organic cycle. And when your body needs it, it tells you, right? Like it, it will good. pull you in. I'm so happy to hear that because that's how I've been doing it. So, yeah, no, <laughs> you know, great. it's it's like confirmation because I, I think you're, well, I know you're right. At least in my experience is, is that when I'm doing a workout and I think most people nowadays know that, that obviously we've got to recover. I'll talk about recovery in my book. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's the second pillar of five. So it's very important. Um, but like, if you're not giving yourself ample recovery time from whether it be a supplement or uh, exercise or any kind of stressful task, we need to be learning the importance of recovery. So taking a step away from some of these, these stressors um, and then listen to your body. So, you know, yeah. when I'm training two or three times a week, I'm doing EMS once or twice a week, which is kind of the standard protocol because you're, you're, you're getting so much firing in your musculature yeah. that you want to recover from that. Um, so this is kind of perfect for how I'm doing it. And then I use neural, uh, usually when I'm doing a podcast. Yeah. So I'm using neural with, uh, transcriptions, um, oh. uh, blue canatine. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah that's, that's all my, <laughs> uh, they're not as, they're not as blue. Cause I, you know, I did brush my teeth before we started the episode, but <laughs> that's hilarious, man. I've done that before too. I, I, the first time I got blue canatine, my, uh, my friend Luke story gave me some, and I thought he gave me two of the full squares and I thought it was one dose. So I downed the whole thing and I, had, I was in California at his place. And then I, I split because I had to do a, another podcast. And so I got on the show and it was a medical podcast and <laughs> man, it kicked in and I was like, hoo -hoo, hoo -hoo, hoo -hoo. <laughs> wow. And I called him after the fact and I was like, man, I took that dose you gave me and I was just like on fire. And he goes, you took all of it? Yeah. And he's like, 
it was two doses, man. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. yeah, he was hooking you up, and you're like, dude, what? Yeah, I thought it was just one shot. So, yeah, it was it was great. I, I have on occasion, actually, with the transcriptions guys, <clears throat> I was working with them on a, uh, a non-addictive opioid, and I was... <laughs> I, I have never had an opioid or had never had an opioid before that, but I, I developed this thing for them and, and figured out a, a process to make it. And I was cleaning up the equipment around the lab and it's supposed to be basically seven milligrams would be as strong as a dose of morphine. And I had never had morphine or anything like that. And I thought, you know, I'm about to send this stuff off. I should probably know what the actual impact is on this. So I was like, okay, seven milligrams. So I put it on my tongue and rubbed it and I thought, eh. I don't really feel anything and you know and then my phone rang and i had a, a conference call that i had not remembered that i was supposed to be on <laughs> with uh with it was actually with dave asprey's group when we were developing the the danger coffee the last coffee that i developed for him um and so i got on this call with the one of the coffee companies and i was talking to them and you know opiates they kick in and when they kick in they kick in hard and so i was in the <laughs> middle of this call and having had no experience in my entire life with any opioid when it kicked in i kind of went Oof. and i suddenly had this moment where i was like holy shit balloon hands what is going on <laughs> and, <laughs> and i had to navigate the remainder of this call while completely out of my mind on uh yeah my my first experience and last experience hopefully hopefully i've never uh negatively impacted by anything physical enough wow i have to do it again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it reminds me of the um, <clears throat> I, I just recently watched the first episode of the series called How to Change Your Mind by, you know, with Michael Pollan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard about it or seen it, but no, um, it's, on it yet. it's on Netflix and it's based on his book, you know, How to Change Your Mind. Yeah. And the first episode, they talk about LSD. So they talk about how it, it was discovered and and essentially it was a mistake in the lab. The guy got it on his finger. But can you imagine like never like having not known what it is and what it's supposed to do and <laughs> you're in the lab and he said that i mean i'm listening to the you know to the audio or whatever but he basically asked one of the uh, lab technicians to follow him home by bike because it was like, so long ago they were on bike so he's riding a bike and he's like the whole world was just morphing you know what i mean i was like damn can you imagine yeah. no man that's uh i yeah that that would be ridiculously intense yeah this yeah. this was bizarre for me the only other thing like that is on the note of like the the psychedelics is i um uh, you know i had never really tried anything but we were working on a uh, a mushroom derivative with psilocybin and so i thought okay well i'll try a micro dose of psilocybin well turns out i'm in that very small percentage of the people that's hypersensitive to it <laughs> so a 25 milligram <laughs> micro dose knocked me on my ass i i actually had my son worked in my lab and i had to have him put me in my office on my chair and <laughs> just stare off into space yeah i don't really have since i'm kind of a straight arrow i don't really have much of a tolerance for a lot of drugs i guess and so very small components kind of have a pronounced impact so yeah, i spent about three hours staring straight up at the ceiling trying to meditate because i was just uh what's that technical term Ah, tripping balls. I think that's. <laughs> I think that's the technical term. Yeah. Damn. Wow, man. I this this is such a fascinating co conversation, and clearly, like, you know, we're we're gonna have to have multiple episodes, and you know, there's gonna obviously be lots of conversations not on camera or not on you know a <laughs> podcast because I just enjoy chatting with you, and I, it almost feels like every time we talk, we it's like we have to catch up in you know another time um but before we start to kind of slowly wrap up because i know you have things to do and i need to probably eat and go to sleep at some point um but um are there what are some other things like i noticed when i was i i had the website up for those who are watching you saw me scrolling through the list of products and i noticed that there was a product at the end of that list called vortex yeah, that's for pets. So Vortex is for animals. And so it's kind of, it's the same thing. One of the things I love about that is when you give, uh, when you give a compound like this to animals, because there's no placebo effect, like you can take, you can take a dog that's hobbling and limping and barely ambulatory and give it to them and they will be back to being a puppy in a couple of days. It's mm. so rewarding. Actually, that that's one of those things I, I hear about it all the time. And I, 
I actually, I'm lucky in that, you know, enough people reach out to me and will actually, they'll have a, a really positive impact from some of these things that they'll actually hit me up and say, Hey, thank you. This did X. And a lot of them are, you know, like specifically with regards to animals, because that was back in the day, the first thing that I launched on C60 was a veterinary product. And it was really interesting to me working through that process because I used it on my own dog. He was a great Pyrenees golden retriever. So like a double XL golden retriever. And he, uh, they're, they have a lot of hip problems, right? Dysplasia mm. and things because they're kind of, they're such large dogs. And when he was seven, he couldn't get up on my bed anymore. Right. And he was like, you know, member of the family and he would hop up on the bed with me, but he couldn't get up and he would, he would put his paws up and kind of slink oh. up. And that was sort of sad, but it was sweet because he was coming up by me. But then when he would get off the bed, he'd put his front paws down and he'd pull himself forward and just <laughs> fall down and, and hit, hit the floor. And it was like, Oh, so such a bummer. So I started giving him the C60 and literally like two weeks later, he was running and three weeks later, he was literally running and jumping up on the bed. And I was like, wow. Oh, shit, this is... Yeah. And that was, that was one of those things right when I first started, that was, you know, like a decade ago. And I was like, wow, that is markedly different. That really made an impact. And, you know, with people, there's always like, Oh, is it kind of a belief thing? Is it a, this or that, you know, I mean, because placebo effect is a legitimate thing. But with animals, I mean, they, it changes their performance so radically that you can see it. I mean, there, there actually, there are a lot of people that do like horse racing and things like that, that use the, uh, the products with horses, uh, because it really radically affects how, how their performance works in the musculature, right? Just the output. So, so it's not, cause that was what I was going to ask you next is that, so it's, it's clearly not just for pain. Uh, it's no, about performance and the ability. No, no. Yeah, it's it drops inflammatory response and it upregulates muscular output. So it's it does a lot of the same things that you know that it works on for people. Back in the day, the the very first thing I developed with that, um, I ended up meeting with like the top six veterinary pharma pharmaceutical companies, and it was kind of a weird experience because like all their science guys were like, you know, they would look at the cytokine analyses and say like, wow, you know, this is twice as effective as what we're doing with glucosamine and chondroitin and MSM. And, but then it would go to the marketing and legal departments and it got shot down every, every time. And then I, I forget if it was Merck or Pfizer, but one of the people actually said, listen, here's the deal. We've spent so much money producing these other products and marketing these other products and getting all the vets up to speed that even if you make it, we'll just come back and buy you for a multiple, but we don't think you'll probably be able to get to market and make it. So, you know, we're not going to blow any money. And, and I was naive at the time. I was like, but it's more effective. It's the better product. And they're like, yeah, yeah I don't care. <laughs> Clearly. Our job is to return shareholder equity. It is not to make animals healthy. So, you know, and, th and that's kind of the same thing applies to pharmaceuticals, right? Yeah. Like those companies, people very often go like, why is it so screwed up? It's not. Those companies work flawlessly. They return a tremendous amount of shareholder equity. That's their job. If their job were actually to make people healthy, it'd be different. That's my job, right? Like I'm, you know, I'm the guy who's trying to make people healthy. They're the guys who are trying to return shareholder equity. It's, it's just mm. a different approach, right? We're both very successful at what we're doing, but we're doing very different things. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I wholeheartedly believe that, you know, the energy you put out, um, you know, it comes back to you tenfold. And, right. um, and I, that, I think that's the reason why you are as successful as you are, because you come from a place of authenticity and integrity and, um, you know, and you're, you're, you're just, you're doing a damn thing, man. So yeah, I am, I, I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah, as you say, I'm, I'm walking the talk, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So, um, <clears throat> one last thing before we go into the last questions, cause I know, you know, we're kind of tight on time. Um, so you had mentioned if it's okay for you to talk about it, but you had mentioned that there's another product you, you want me to try out. Oh yeah. Keto, keto new. So that's uh yeah, it's an exogenous ketone ester coupled with, uh, some neurostimulating things. And so it's kind of, uh, like the, the guys in the lab jokingly say it's like 12 hour energy and it, it pops. So you get like with neural RX, you get, you get this kind of slow boost and it picks you up and you can motor through your day, but it takes a little while to come on with, with the keto new it's five minutes. You're like, whoop. it's like the light switch goes on. 
And so it's a, a really potent exogenous ketone ester. So your ketone levels go up, you know, like two, two to three millimolar in about an hour. And it's very effective. And the coolest part is it tastes good. It, uh, which is <laughs> really, yeah. Oh, yeah. ketone esters for anybody who's tried them. Ketone esters are abysmally bad. Like they are horrible. It's like drinking jet fuel. Yeah. Um, but this one is actually good. It tastes like sweet tarts. So, and, and it, hmm. yeah. and that's not, a, that's not on the website right now, right? No, it's not on the website. It probably won't actually get launched until next year. So yeah, it's, um, uh, we've got, we've got, I think a couple of other projects that are in the works where, so we've got the keto new, then we have one, um, that derma RX, which is more like a, for psoriasis and things like that, uh, which we've had a lot of luck helping people out with things like that. And then, you know, it's a fine line though, because a, a lot of these products, they serve specific purposes and they, and they fill a need. Um, but the way the system is structured, you know, you can neither make any nor medical claim nor, you know, cure or disease or anything like that. And so, you know, fair enough. Um, even if you, if you're sitting on something where you go like, look, this does the thing, it is the cure. You can't actually say it for fear of reprisal or getting shut down. And, and that's, so it's kind of this balancing act where you have to, you know, like not a flamethrower, you know, you have to take the approach of that. So some of these things are slow and that's why, you know, like with, with the keto new, it's great because it shifts you into ketosis really rapidly. So it stimulates weight loss and it gives you the super clear mental focus. And there, there's some other things that I've been working on that I'm pretty jazzed about. Like, um, you know, some of the things like uh, peroxisome stuff, PPAR agonists, like doing the uh, peroxisome agonist receptors and kind of modulating those so that your body can burn fats and utilize them. And there's, there's, a, there's so much there. Like you can, if you really start to modulate biology, you can do so much and, and provide such a benefit to people. Like when I had COVID, um, it, it triggered myocarditis and my heart was really racked out and, um, I wasn't really feeling that hot. And then I, I went through a lot of therapies, but one of the things that helped me probably more than anything else was this thing called GW501516 <laughs> and from GW Pharmaceuticals. And it's kind of a like a weightlifting supplement because it's a PPAR agonist. And and that basically what that means is it's it triggers your body's ability to burn fats. Well, your heart functions solely through beta oxidation of lipids. So it's deriving its energetic component from the oxidizing of lipids, fats. And when you stimulate that and you can accelerate that component, then you actually can breathe, you can, you, you know, have more endurance and you can do things. And so that particular compound is classed as a research compound, but my personal experience with it was great. The problem is it uh, got taken out of clinical trials because they found that it was stimulating cancer production, right? So, and, mm. you know, yeah, and <clears throat> that's- Mentor, maybe? Mentor what's that? Pathway? Was it affecting mTOR pathways? Well, actually, I'm not sure if they ever identified the pathway. You know, mm. like most drugs, when you're when you're in that process and you're doing an FDA clinical trial, and somebody says it's causing cancer, you know, they hit the ripcord so fast <laughs> that I don't think it probably it probably snapped them uh, to drop it and abandon the trials. But if, if you know how to modulate cellular biology so that there's no chance for oncogenesis, right? No, no possibility of stimulating cancer formation. Then, then that's a pretty easy thing to work around. So that's one of the things that we're kind of developing. <laughs> yeah, is uh, things wow. to enhance weight loss and and physical performance and endurance that don't cause cancer. So you know. Wow. Well, listen, I, I am like in all seriousness. I think you already know this by now, but if you don't, um, I am happy to uh, test out any of this stuff that you that you're you know coming up with especially the stuff yeah, you've been talking about I, like, literally i'll send it to you because I, I would i would love your honest unabashed feedback i mean you know if you think it tastes great if you think it works well tell me if you think it sucks then great because i would much rather and i do this with everything right like i'll, I'll give all these products to people some some of them like people with alzheimer's things like that for specific needs but everything else i give to people because i want people that I can trust who will give me feedback and say, great, right. that's genius. Wow. That sucks. You know, right. because you, you're going to hit some of both of those. Right. So, yeah. 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 I'll Beautiful. send it your way, man. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I'm, I'm even more convinced that we're going to, I'm going to speed up this whole situation with uh, getting you a suit because um, you know, 
life always happens and there's going to be a number of things that kind of slow production and all that stuff. But, um, I think I figured out a way, especially since I just took this, my brain is firing better. So, um, I think I just figured out a way to get, get you one. Um, because you know, I missed going to Oklahoma to do the whole book launch thing. There's a whole story behind that. I'll tell you about, but, um, nonetheless, let's start to kind of wrap this up. Is there anything else that you want to touch on before we go into the last questions? No, man, this has been great. I, I love so the way fun. you set this up as a conversation. It's great. It's yeah. To, to me, like, I literally want people to, to be like either with me in my apartment listening to you or with you in your lab listening to me. And yeah. we just kind of all vibing out. And one of these days when, when things start to really work the way I want them to work, um, it's going to be like that. It's very much going to be like that. Yeah, it's going to be. Seriously, you're yeah. always welcome here. Like anytime, anytime you're coming home to visit the fam, just swing by, you know? Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm I would keep that in mind. To see the place. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to take you up on it for sure. Um, so, yeah. And, and of course, I guess to your point, like we can always have you back for another show or several shows to talk about other things yeah. because uh, some of the stuff you shared with me before we started recording. <laughs> Woo, yeah, my friend. There's some cool stuff going on. Yeah, it's yeah, actually yeah. Uh, it's between that and some of the propulsion systems and stuff we've been doing. Like, we're, yeah, it's this is like Disneyland for the curious mind, right? So, it's yeah. like every day yeah. when I come in here, I really am like, holy shit, wow, I actually get paid to do this. This is awesome. Woo, so yeah. cool. Yeah, well, I want to be there, and I will be there at some point. So, um, yeah, get ready. Um, all right. So for the, the end of the show, when I have a guest on, I always ask two questions. Uh, the first question is, what are your top two pet peeves? Like, what are, what are two things that just kind of get under your skin, whether it's from, you know, the work you do or just life in general? What are two things that just kind of rub you wrong? Um, well, I think actually the, the, biggest, the biggest obstacle to society moving forward is having the having the wrong structure and people people having the uh, the belief that they have a knowledge about something right like the the appearance of having knowledge about something probably inhibits us actually as a species having knowledge about a lot of stuff more than mm-hmm. anything else because we think we know so we don't we stop our lines of inquiry we don't actually go deep and we don't revisit things right like something like uh, this ozone project I worked on. Um, you know, they, they solved an equation that was this fellow named Du Bois solved this equations in 1924 for wavelengths and emissive frequencies. And that was kick ass in 1924, but things have changed. Right. And so I had to go back when I was doing this project and rewrite all that stuff because the underlying physics, physics didn't change. Right. But our interpretation of what reality is, we have new tools and new techniques. So, you know, 98 years later, I can go back and go, yeah, that's great but there's this special case that does this and, and knowledge doesn't typically do that. We, we don't, we're not terribly self-referential and that always gets me because I think if we actually looked back and checked, we get it, but we have, you know, just so much hubris and so much ego that as like academicians, right? Like you, like when you're an academic, you look at something and you don't want to go, you know what? I totally screwed that. I'm wrong. It doesn't work that way right? You're entrenched, right? Like if you've spent 25 years doing something, you don't want to let go of your preconceived notions. And that is like the most surefire way not to move the ball forward. And the responsibility should not be to ourselves. It should actually be to the species, like to move humanity forward. And so that, yeah, that actually kind of riles me a bit because I see it all the damn time. And a really uh, good one. That's a really good one. In fact, I mean, that one I think is sufficient enough to, to, to take up too, because it's so, it's so major. And, um, and, and it actually stemmed one more thing that I want to mention before we go to the last question. Um, because you were also involved in creating, uh, the resistor and antigen, antigen, right? Yeah. Resistor. And yeah, those are mine. Yep. And I, I, I have those as well. So I should have oh, like, right lifted on. those up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Again, I know we talked about this before we started recording, but most people who follow me know that I'm a huge proponent of ozone. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I use longevity resources and, you know, I've even toyed around with, I mean, for years I've been toying around with uh, uh, using the, the ozonated oils and, and using, you know, all of all of the stuff. Mm-hmm. And then 
uh, clearly one of the problems though is that it's not very portable right until the until, resistor yeah, until resistor right? yeah and that's yeah. actually that was the thing i was trying to crack is because i wanted to be able to give people basically the effect of auto hemotherapy which for people who don't know is where you go you extract your blood you mix it with a low concentration of ozone it reacts and then you re-inject it and so you, you know you pull your blood out it's kind of dark you hit it with the ozone turns bright cherry red which mm -hmm. is because it's hyper oxygenated and then it ha and it triggers these the interaction of the lipids in the ozone uh goes away in just a couple of seconds because it's ozone is the, like the third most reactive molecular species so they're about 100 million molecular interactions a second so just a couple seconds in it's spent and that's why the color shifts to that beautiful cherry red is because it's all hyper oxygenated but it also triggers these things called ozonides which are stimulating signaling molecules and so when you pump that back in it upregulates your body's own endogenous systems your mitochondria start firing you feel a little flush of heat you're hyper oxygenated and it kind of tells your body's immune system react do this and and that's beneficial but it's kind of a bitch because you got to go to a doctor's office pull your blood out but it's a great therapy so i was trying to figure out okay how can i do that on the fly and so when i started doing the that's research the puzzle that's yeah, the puzzle it, it part. Was, right? It was a good puzzle, right? So it was a, myself and my friend Bobby. Bobby, we, he had a bunch of real estate in Austin, and we, this was when the shutdown was starting, and we were trying to figure out how to disinfect things. And so we went from disinfecting things with UV to disinfecting things with ozone to mm -hmm. why can't we just have the people buffered, you know, by giving them the ozone therapy? And so... Yep. And, and when, when, you know, when we were talking about it, he was like, well, do you think you can figure that out? I was like, mm, honestly, probably not, but I'll try. <laughs> so, and so at the end of the day, yeah, it, um, but that, that actually, that goes back to the De Broglie equations, right? So when I was looking at that, I was like, okay, how did this come to be? So I went back and I looked at where ozone came from in an oil and it was Nikola Tesla and Tesla mm -hmm. Tesla was actually sharp, right? Like he was a smart guy. And so his process was like this eight week long process where he had these long magnetic field beds, would fill them with olive oil and then slowly bubble ozone through it while the yep. velocity changed. Everybody for the past hundred years has been like, yeah, that's some stupid weird tech Tesla thing. It didn't really matter. We just whip ozone through oil and that's good enough. That's wrong. Actually, what he was doing was ozone forms a polar molecule right so you've got an o3 is ozone mm -hmm. and it's got this unstable oxygen atom kicked off so it has polarity and because of that you can get it to orient itself in a line if you put it in a magnetic field so he was actually using the magnetic field to lock it in position so it was the highest density without interaction you could get and as the viscosity changed it stabilized in that configuration so when i figured out what he was doing i was like holy shit, that guy's brilliant that was wow. such like a such a smart approach. And then I thought, okay, well, I can do that. But I've had a hundred years of new tech. What would Tesla do if he were alive now? And so I started thinking about it. I was like, well, I wonder if I can make this a coherent molecule. And what I always say is like the difference between a light bulb and a laser, right? Even if you have the same number of emissive photons, a light bulb they're pumping off, they'll warm a hot dog. A laser, they're pumping off coherently, they'll punch a hole through steel. And it's all about <laughs> coherence and phase, right? So I thought, well, I wonder if I can actually make this a coherent molecule. And so I started playing with all these kind of plasma drivers and frequency oscillators, and I figured out a way to actually change that. And so the, the de Broglie equation that I had referenced before from 1924, and this is kind of one of the precepts of quantum physics. Um, because de Broglie got the, the Nobel Prize in 24 for it, uh, or actually I think a couple years later, but he developed it in 24. Um, basically what it says is everything has an emissive wavelength based on the energetics of, of the totality, right? So you've got your nucleus and you have your electron orbitals and that's the, that's the energy. Well, that's not actually right, right? That's like saying in the solar system, all of the power of the whole solar system is the planets revolving around the sun. That's wrong, right? There's a tremendous amount of confined energy in the rotational force, right? So you've got this angular momentum that's humming as all the planets revolve on their own axis. So not only do you have the revolution, but you have the rotation. And even though electrons are a point particle, they still have spin. 
everything mm -hmm. has been, right? Mm -hmm. So I figured, well, what if I could confine all of that and get the spin to be coherent and I could get everything entrained at the same rate? What would happen? Because I was trying to figure out how to modulate it and make it stronger. So I tested that and it worked, but it, it only lasted like an hour, right? So I was like, well, mm -hmm. that's awesome, but that's, you know, it makes some difference, right? Like I put the, it the coherence off. lasted yeah, an hour yeah, coherence and it would just, it would spin off. Right. So like you get everything in trained, it's vibing mm -hmm. the right way and, ooh, and it bleeds off. Um, so then I thought, well, what's an example of something that's got coherence that locks. And I started thinking about holographic plates and, you know, you've seen a holographic glass plate. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that's interesting to me about that, if you take a holographic plate and you shatter it, right? And you take one molecule of silicon dioxide, right? That's left over and you fire a laser through that. The information that was contained in that entire hologram is contained in that one molecule. And you can recreate the entire information from that one molecule. It stores that waveform down to wow. the molecule. And the crazy bit is it stores it down to photonic scale. So it's an accurate representation below the electron level, right? So you're like sub sub atomic particles you can get it down to photon scale if you're using a coherent source. So I started thinking, well, glass isn't actually a solid. It's an amorphous solid, not a crystalline solid. So like if you looked at glass over 10,000 years, it would be like a soap bubble kind of moving down, right? And it's not as static as we think. It's in a different temporal scale. So for us, 10,000 years is a long time. For a sheet of glass, it just makes it move like water. So I thought, well, I've got this gel I wonder if I could use the gel as a holographic storage medium if I pulse my lasers really quickly, because the difference in time scale between the glass and the gel, they're really similar. And it's kind of one of these things is not like the other. Well, the laser, the pace of that is not like the other. The other two are really similar. So I set up this plasma confinement field and then I use lasers and dichroic beam splitters, which is how you make a hologram. And I fired everything through in these coherent bursts to lock all of the states and to get the coherence locked in a spin state. And so I basically use the gel. So when you take one of those capsules, it's basically a holographic gel is what you're ingesting. And it's locked in those spin states so that it upregulates your body. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> all, yeah, like, a, all the components were there. It just hadn't been quite cobbled together, you know? So that's, that's it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I, I feel even better about having it. And I hope people listening to this, like, if we still have you, if you're still listening, um, you know, and, and, and we didn't lose you at the beginning, um, then yeah, kudos to you. Go and check out Wizard Sciences. We're going to answer this last question and then we'll obviously give Ian an opportunity to let you know how to best stay in touch with him and keep up to what he's doing. But for this last question, what is something you are most grateful for, Ian? Wow. So much. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I stumped you in a question, I think. I mean, yeah. not, not that we're like going for that, but you know what I mean? Like, this is the first time well, I think you. It's actually the, the thing not to be contrite or kind of cheesy, but literally like so much every day. Uh, yeah, I don't want to start crying. Uh, everything, like so much, man. Every day yeah. I wake up, I get to do this. I get to contribute. I get to help people. It's, uh, I mean, that's genuinely what I feel like I'm here for. People ask me all the time, like, oh, you know, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I'm here to help. That, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, I really do feel like that's my purpose is like trying to help move the needle for things. And I've been gifted with some very different abilities. And so I feel like it's incumbent upon me to use them in a, in a really positive way to contribute. And I'm legitimately grateful for that because it, it could have gone the other way you know it could have been a life of you know quiet obscurity and instead it's a life filled with purpose and love and and i get to interact with people that are just remarkable you know mm. i mean wow so wow. yeah yeah that's i feel it i feel it coming through and i can attest to the fact that you know you've been nothing but what you just explained to me and so i i i'm fortunate to be able to call upon you and it and, and take up your time on a, on a Tuesday. I'm happy and, to do it truly. Yeah. Yeah, really. yeah. It's just, this has been fun. And, um, how can people find out more about you and, and, you know, like the socials and the websites and, and, and all that jazz Yeah, go, go to wizard sciences.com. Uh, you can hit me up on Instagram and everybody laughs about this. All my friends tell me I'm insane for doing it, but I still answer every message personally. So just hit me that. up at Ian Mitchell one. Um, and if anybody, you know, if, 
if somebody has a problem or there's something you think I can help with, and I get a lot of those. Um, it takes a while because I do have kind of a backlog of, of things, but I, I legitimately will work through it and, uh, and I'll get back to you. And so there's that, and then go to biocharge.co. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. There's not, there's not a, a ton of stuff out there, but that's, uh, you know, and my team at either company, they'll, you know, if you need to get me, they'll, they'll route it to me. So if you, if anybody out there needs me, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. And just to reiterate, um, to, to find the resistor capsules he was just talking about and amp, amp, amptogen, right? Yeah. Amptogen. Amp yeah. Yes. To, to find resistor and amptogen that's at biocharged, right? Dot yeah, biocharged.co. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, of course, I will link to all of that. I will, you know, uh, get make this as easy as possible for people to find out. Um, and I don't even know if we even discussed this, and not to even put you on the spot with it, but um, if we have any kind of discount codes, yeah, um, I'll, I'll get some set up and have them sent over to you. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for that, and I'll I'll list that in the show notes, everyone. So if you're listening or watching, go to the show notes. That's where I keep all the, the information to, to find out more and to, you know, get hooked up with discounts and whatnot. Um, but Ian, thank you for your time, man. And it was, a thank you. Gosh, thank thank you. you for all that you do. And, uh, I would look forward to being in touch very soon. And, yeah, um, when, when we sign off, if you don't mind, just hang out for a little bit. Yeah, I just want to ask you a couple more things, okay? okay? Awesome. All right, this is Josh signing out with Ian Mitchell, okay. Wizard Sciences, and Biocharge.co. Peace. Until next time. Walk the talk, talking facts. Move like me, but I move a little fast. Make my move, here to last. Fast in these belts, I'm coming past. Take care of me, longevity. Hack my biology, better believe. Walking the talk, so my and body connected. Better come give us a listen. Better come give us a minute or two. Open the box up, we giving you tools. Giving your engine the fuel that it needs. Breathing into it, it's autoimmune. Make a connection, we're stronger in two. Making us one of a kind of a few. Work on the mind, but show me your moves. If you do what you say, you know what to do. Yeah.